Our scripture this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John, the first chapter, beginning at verse 29. Listen for God's word for you. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and he watched as Jesus walked by, and he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard, Jesus, heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's interesting to think upon this scene where Jesus has been baptized um, it's the next day, John's out, says it's four o'clock in the afternoon, you know, uh, you know what happens around that time, you know, everybody's kind of gone through their morning, maybe they've eaten too big a lunch, you know, starting to get a little tired as the day goes on, you know, it's getting toward the, the end of the day, um, you know, around here, although it'd be different there, but, you know, around here this time of year, four o'clock, you know, you get the last bit of, of sun in the day, you get the warmest time of the day, so, uh, you know, that's maybe the last chance you get to get something done before, uh, you know, daylight's over, and, uh, you know, four to six, that's that, that kind of period. Um, there, you know, it's a little closer to the equator, so the day lasts a little longer. But, um, you know, think about, about that day, about uh, most of it having gone through. And, and as uh, John is there with a couple of his disciples, uh, they see Jesus. And, and he points out to them, uh, here's the one who takes away the sin of the world. Um, takes away the sin, not of good people, not the sin of people, but the sin of the world. Wow. I mean, that, that's... Not just for good people. You know, Jesus said, you know, we're, people are willing to lay their life down for someone who's good, but for someone who is not, um, I think that's, it's, it's big to think about. It takes away the sin of the world. Um, Reinhold Niebuhr was a theologian in the mid-20th uh, century. Um, he was a professor at University of Chicago at Union Theological. Um, he was one of the leading voices. He you know, was on the cover of Time magazine. He uh, talked about corporate sin, that there's sinfulness in how our society is organized, and not necessarily about the sins of individuals, but the, the, the way our world is broken in terms of how the poor get treated, um, how those who are marginalized are treated, and, and he said God's kingdom is about breaking down not just our personal sin, but corporate sin in the world, about changing the way in which we live and work and, and be with one another. That, that's the kind of thing that Jesus talked about. 
Um, taking away the sin of the world, all the ways that, that life falls short of what it's intended to be. To, to, you know, to, to borrow a phrase, uh, to make a more perfect union, to make a more perfect world, to move us toward um, what God's desire for the world is. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Um, that there's, there's a, a movement within the world toward a more perfect world, that Jesus takes away the sin of the world. Not just to break down our own sin, but to make the world more just and more proper. Uh, and so Jesus uh, is seen by them. And he said, there he is, he's the one. And these two decide, well, we've been following John. If John says he's greater... Maybe we ought to follow him. And so they just begin following him. They don't, they don't say anything. They, it's, it's a really fascinating conversation that takes place. I mean, they've not said anything at this point. They just begin hanging around. Um, have you ever noticed, known someone who you just were so drawn to, you just wanted to kind of be around them? Um, you wanted to hang around in their presence because of, of their very nature. Something of that happened with them. They saw in Jesus something that they wanted to be close to, and so they began following. Jesus notices, you know. I don't think it's like some uh, private investigator, you know, kind of situation where he notices someone following him in that way. He, but he notices them, and, and he turns and he stops. And, and it's, again, I think it's a fascinating conversation. These are the first words of Jesus in the Gospel of John. To this point in the Gospel, John, Jesus has not spoken a word. And so these are the very first words of Jesus. What are you looking for? Could pretty much sum up the rest of the Gospel there. Uh, what are you looking for? It's about people who are looking for something more in their lives. And, and, and again, the way the Gospel of John goes, Jesus asks over and over again, uh, such simple questions that have a double meaning all the way through. Um, and, you know, whenever he's, he talks to the woman at the well, one of the perfect examples, he's talking about living water. And, and they can talk about water from the well, if that's what they want to talk about. Or they can talk about a spiritual water that nourishes a thirst within our lives. Um, what are you looking for? Oh, you know, we're looking for Fourth and Iowa. We're looking for, they could have given a physical address. They could have given a location, a place. But um, they, they, that's not what they're looking for. They're not lost. They don't need to call up Google Maps to find where they're headed. They're looking for something. Have you ever looked for something like that? Um, we know what it's like to be lost occasionally. I've, I've been lost once in my life. You know, I, I know what it's like to have been lost, and uh, you know the the. But but sometimes you know we're, it's not about trying to get to where physically we're trying to get to. Uh, sometimes it's about something. We're more lost than that. We're looking for something deeper. What are you looking for? I think Jesus asks us those kind of questions in our lives all the time, questions that we can just take at the surface level and blow off and move forward, or we can go deeper. Remember the uh, Zacchaeus, not Zacchaeus, I always do that, Zacchaeus and uh, uh, oh, third chapter in John, I should have uh, uh, wrote this down so I wouldn't you know, lose it, but uh, you know, the uh, man comes to Jesus at night and they uh, are visiting and as they're uh, they're visiting, um, you know, talks about being born again. And he, he takes it at the literal level, right? Nicodemus, Zacchaeus and Nicodemus. I get those two names confused all the time. Nicodemus, and he's, um, you know, he's, he's, he, Jesus says, well, you have to be born again. And he's like, well, you can't, I can't re-enter my mother's womb. I'm a grown man. How could that happen? Uh, I can't be born again. Um, maybe he's talking about something deeper. 
Maybe there's an occurrence, an occasion in our lives where there, there's something that happens and we can either choose to just look at it on the surface and just move right through or we can take it as an opportunity to move deeper. I think Jesus gives us those moments all the time in our lives. What are you looking for? Are you looking for something? They don't quite know that answer yet, but they're not willing to give the surface answer, but they're, they're working on it. And I think that's pretty fascinating. I, I think Jesus takes us where we're at. And if we're willing to go a step further, he's willing to let us go further and to bring us in to a deeper level of faith and understanding, to allow that part of our life that's looking for something to be addressed. And, and so, you know, they say, where are you staying? It, fascinating, you know, this conversation. What are you looking for? And then they ask a question, where are you staying? We don't know quite what we're looking for, but maybe it has something to do with you. Fascinating conversation. Um, Jesus drawn in this first conversation that uh, is, is within the Gospel of John, that the very first words of Jesus, what are you looking for? And their answer, where are you staying? There are probably lots of places we can look for answers. There are lots of places people look for answers. Um, People do that in all kinds of religions. I think there's something that in the way that, that God has created us that draws us closer toward him, that uh, we, we look for him more deeply and fully. We look for the bigger answers. Sometimes it's not enough just to, to uh, deal with the day-to-day in life. You know, there are days, there are big chunks of days, maybe weeks we go where we just deal with the things that are in front of us, just deal with that. And then the big questions come back to us, the big questions of our meaning and purpose and what life is about and what we're doing and uh, am I making an impact and can, uh, you know, just all those wrestling things. Um, They're part of our design of how we're created. I was... uh, you should, I have a subscription, I've had a subscription to XM Radio, it ran out. And so, uh, you know, I, there are certain stations I love to listen to, and right now I can't listen to them because I hadn't re- renewed the subscription. I keep like, okay, you know, do I want to, do I really want to renew it or not? You know, kind of that conversation. And uh, so, you know, some of the stations I have saved, they're a little different list on it, and I was leaving the church the other day for lunch, and um, there was a, an interview with Elaine Pagels. Elaine Pagels is a, a religion professor at Princeton University. She uh, particularly studies New Testament uh, and then other, uh, other gospels and other texts of literature that were written about the same time as the, the New Testament. That's kind of her main focus of study. And um, she was being interviewed. She's written dozens of books, scholarly books, and ones that are a little more aimed at the public. Most of them are pretty scholarly. They're pretty tough to read. Um, but dozens of books uh, on, on Christianity and the early Christian church and early followers of Jesus. She was married to, a, he's passed away, a Harvard or a, another Princeton professor. He was a professor of particle physics. Um, and, and, and so as in their conversations, uh, he would he always kind of looked at religion a little weird and, and said, um, why, why do you study religion? And, um, and so she said, well, why would you study particle physics? And as they went through the conversation, they really realized that each of them were looking for a way to explain life in the world. And they were looking for the deeper questions within it. And then he began to understand that uh, maybe they weren't so different after all. Uh, we're all searching looking for that sense of meaning. We search in a lot of places. Uh, David Wilcox, one of my favorite musicians, he uh, sings a song about uh, kind of, maybe it's the empty that we have within us that, that keeps us searching long enough till we find that which can actually fill it. Um, it's, and, and so to have that sense of emptiness or longing for something more is not that we 
it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. It's a part of how God has created us to search for more. Not that we don't have enough faith because we have some bit of empty within. It's just we need to keep looking until we get a hold of something that's big enough to fill that place of empty. These two are asked, what are you looking for? And they answer, um, where are you staying? Because maybe we got a hold of a little bit of that. Maybe it has something to do with you, Jesus. Jesus is the one who comes to fill that place, to answer the biggest mysteries of our life, to help us find our our location, to follow him. Um, It's it's through him I've come to know God's grace in my life. Uh, God has graced me, blessed my life so much through the faith I have in Jesus. And, and that's what makes the difference for me. It, it is the grounding. It's the everything that I need is found there. It doesn't mean there aren't other good answers out there. There are lots of answers out there. This is the place where, though, I've come to know the answers are in him, in Jesus. And that's good enough. It's, it's the place that where we are able to hold on to and know who we are and to know that there's something that satisfies those uh, deepest desires. It's what keeps us searching long enough till we actually find him. What are you looking for? Where are you staying? Because I think if I hang around you, it's just going to be better. Um, that's, that's what we've got. That kind of faith, that kind of experience. It's not about a set of doctrines and beliefs. It's not about all that. It's about a relationship with that man. That man who um, came to take away the sins of the world. Not just good people, not bad people, all the world, all of us. It's fascinating, fascinating to see. And in him, we come to know the fullness of our life. And in him, we find that sense of purpose and direction. Then it becomes a, a little different journey once we go. Um, they say, where are you staying? And Jesus has a very simple response. Come and see. Come and see. He always leaves it open for them to make the choice. Jesus always leaves the door open. He, he allows us the opportunity to probe deeper or to sit back and say, ah, I've had enough. But he always does it in such a way that, that tempts us, draws us in to want to know more, to be more connected. Come and see. It's not something that he needs to explain to them. It's something they need to encounter. You know, the, the biggest journey we make in our lives is from I know to I know, right? Right? I mean, we can know a lot of things, but until we know it deep in our heart, what difference does it really make? That's the longest journey, and when we make that journey, we know it in our hearts, then we got a hold of something really good. Uh, Jesus says, come and see, come encounter, let your life be thrown into this life with me. It's an invitation, an invitation to follow, much like when the... uh, the uh, fishermen were out, and, and they, were, they ran into Jesus, and, and, and he says, come follow me, and they leave their nets behind, and they come and follow. It's the same kind of story. Jesus draws them in, an invitation to follow. Millard Fuller was a, a wealthy businessman who had been pretty dissatisfied in his life. Uh, things just didn't seem to really come together the way he wanted in turn. I mean, everything was good, everything, but, but he just was dissatisfied. There was something more he was looking for. Clarence Jordan was a Baptist preacher. He started what was called Koinonia Farms in Georgia. It's during the time of the Civil Rights Movement and uh, lived out a radical sense of justice and equality. Um, and through, on the farm, uh, had, had people from all walks of life, from 
ethnic backgrounds that were a part of the community they created at Koinonia Farms, an alternative Christian lifestyle of equality in the midst of a broken and segregated world. And so it stood out as a beaming light, radical light to live out God's justice in the world. And uh, somebody suggested to him, maybe you should go talk to Clarence. And so he went down there. I mean, Clarence Jordan, his, um, because of, of his work, he was targeted by the KKK. The, uh, the farm was targeted by the KKK. They, but they found a way to carve out the space of, uh, of a different worldview. And so Millard Fuller went. He went to have lunch with Clarence Jordan. And then he didn't leave. He stayed because he experienced something that was about so much more than he had ever known in the world. He experienced a way of following Jesus that brought him peace. Yeah, I mean, he did leave back and forth, but he, he, he came and he stayed for a month before he returned. Whenever we uh, experience that, and we're willing to open the door, it's life-changing. When, when, when Jesus comes by and we see the opportunity, um, he'll ask you, what are you looking for? I hope you find a way to answer that allows him to draw you in. Where are you staying, Jesus? Because he'll invite us to come and see. There's a wealthy woman who had gone to visit Mother Teresa, um, moved by what she'd experienced and what she saw. She whipped out her checkbook and quickly was about to write a check. And Mother Teresa closed the checkbook and said, no money. She said, then what can I do? She said, come and see. And she took the woman to one of the impoverished boroughs, which is just around the corner, just outside the door. And there she picked up a little street child, this little girl, picked her up and put her into the arms of this wealthy woman, and she said, care for her. Care for her. She said it changed her life. Um, she'd grown up in a family where you could write a check, and that took care of it. It's something so much more. Nothing wrong with writing checks, by the way. But Jesus calls for so much more. He wants our life. He wants our heart. He wants a relationship. He wants more than that. Come and see. Amen.